When Britain nuked itself by humongous. The heat was unbearable. The inferno was unlike anything the men had encountered before. After all, these weren't dedicated firefighters, but instead individuals developing plutonium to fuel Britain's first atomic bomb. What was burning wasn't wood or even coal. It was the nuclear core used to produce the above unstable element. This radioactive behemoth towered over the men, who were clad in clothes as protective as cardigan sweaters and poking the leviathan with alloy poles like cavemen prodding fire with sticks. This menacing device came filled with uranium rods, now in various stages of ignition. Unlike wood, which has a half-life in minutes when burning, uranium is one of the most lethal materials known to humans, sometimes hanging around hundreds of millions, if not billions of years. Uranium-235 spends its existence damaging anything it contacts, including people, and altering atomic structure. 1957. England's governing body was desperate. The island country had watched the U.S. monopolize potential for human extermination since 1945, with atomic detonations above Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Great Britain's sovereignty was itching to own a weapon of their own. If the asshole down the way can fry 13 lizards under a magnifying glass, you want to be able to fry 14, right? The equivalent of that street bully, the United States, refused to share its toys, trinkets that had thus far killed hundreds of thousands of people. When you can beat everybody up, why play nice? Hence, the U.S. government denied other nations access to secrets used in production of their weapons of mass annihilation. Austere mandates were imposed to ensure details of the Manhattan Project, from whence the first atomic explosion came, remained a mystery. Britain was stubborn, though, and wouldn't be denied, even at the expense of countless human lives. Lives, no less, of their own citizens. Government. It's as compassionate as a cannibalistic, psychopathic serial killer. Begun in 1947, Windscale was a facility designed for production of plutonium-239, an essential component of atomic weapons. Unlike contemporary nuclear reactors, which tend to be cooled with water, Windscale was cooled by air. Radioactive cores at the plant were known as the Windscale piles, of which there were two standing 24 feet high and measuring 50 feet in diameter. Inside these structures resided numerous 12-inch long uranium rods. In Britain's race to become a member of the Atomic Club, safety precautions at wind scale that would have slowed production were overlooked. Twin 400-foot tall chimneys were employed to vent the air that cooled the reactors, fraught with radionuclides, over an unawares population. It wasn't until the final stages of production that a filtering system of questionable ability was included as a safety measure. This last-minute addition was known as Cockroft's Folly, named for the physicist who insisted on its implementation. Windscale was designed in the early stages of the atomic era, when scientists were finding their way via trial and error. The problem with this approach is, not only could scientists be affected by their mistakes, but so too could billions of people worldwide. Quote-unquote experts were unaware that graphite, exposed to the bombardment of neutrons, often stockpiles that accumulated energy, releasing it in a sudden emission of heat. As a result, scientists blindly built carbon stacks around the reactor core for protection. Over time, this recipe for disaster became apparent, and a process known as annealing, Superheating the bricks to gradually discharge their reserve energy was developed. This procedure was always carried out when the reactor was loaded with its maximum uranium storage, thereby at its most dangerous. Mm. Since wind scale was never created with this contingency in mind, instruments used to calculate heat accumulation were often ineffective. Workers at the plant were constantly recording inaccurate readings. Even though annealing worked for a time, on October 7, 1957, this process proved disastrous. After inserting control rods to cool the reactor, employees noticed no temperature decrease due to faulty equipment. 
As a result, workers started the procedure again, releasing the rods. Immediately, heat increased. Graphite bricks, which only ignited extreme temperatures, began to slowly burn. It took a mere four days for plant operators to decide things had reached a crucial point and mitigatory action need be taken. Two facility workers donned protective gear and headed toward the reactor's charge face, where uranium rods were stored. Opening the wall, these men were astounded to discover, quote, four channels of fuel glowing bright cherry red, unquote. In layman's terms, this indicated the reactor had been burning at least 48 hours. These guys were on as much of a roll as a square bowling ball. Let's emphasize the difference between a coal facility ablaze and a plutonium plant burning. Smoldering coal can be lethal and thus should never be ingested. The same can be said for burning uranium. The disparity being that uranium-235 is invisible and lingers for hundreds of millions of years, entering organisms, causing deformities, and creating cancer. Unlike dust, radioactive fallout isn't swept away. The horror released by Chernobyl in 1986 will remain on Earth far longer than you, your children, their progeny, and a number of generations subsequent. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Since Windscale was unprepared to handle a burning core, workers were willing to try anything to palliate this catastrophe. The plant being air-cooled, employees deduce starting the fans may remedy the situation. Anybody knows you blow on flames to stoke them. Oxygen fuels fire. When faced with an emergency, those at the helm failed to think rationally. As a result, fans were engaged, and the fire raged even more out of control. Next, employees approached the charge phase using ad hoc poles, normally part of scaffolding, to push irradiated rods out the back of the reactor core. When removed, these alloy staffs were often drenched in liquefied uranium. Workers found themselves stabbing a raging reaction, begging it to cease its onslaught. Conventional fires rage, but eventually burn out due to lack of oxygen, dissipation of fuel, or perhaps contact with a water source. Every moment a nuclear fire burns, deadly particles are released into the air that travel vast distances. Should these radionuclides come in contact with someone 100, 1,000, or even 10,000 miles away, they can result in suffering and death. To a degree, workers at Windscale knew this. As a result, abandoning the facility meant genocide for countless individuals worldwide. Another improvised solution was employed when liquid carbon dioxide was shipped from Calder Hall, a nearby gas-cooled nuclear facility. Hopeful this substance would douse the flames, 25 metric tons of it were pumped into the charge phase. Rather than diminishing the blaze, when the heat contacted the dual elements, it separated the oxygen and fed off it, increasing the fire's intensity. By October 11th, scientists were at wit's end. Roughly 11 tons of uranium were on fire, and temperatures inside the reactor had reached 1,300 degrees Celsius, increasing 20 degrees every minute. With the containment surrounding the reactor near collapse, scientists decided to vanquish the blaze with water. This may have seemed the obvious resolution all along, but one need understand molten metal oxidizes when combined with H2O. As a result, capacious quantities of hydrogen would develop, possibly leading to an explosion of epic proportion. Fortunately, this procedure, along with shutting down the fans, worked, saving humanity from a monumental cataclysm. It's been concluded Cockroft's folly at the top of both Windscale smokestacks actually prevented discharge of much more deadly contaminant than the 20,000 Curies released. Like Janet Jackson's face, I find it difficult to believe this historical happening is real. Unfortunately, what occurred at Windscale and the stupidity displayed therein is fact. <laughs>